them away. Raketi tamachari. Dharma protects those who practice the Dharma. Sometimes it seems like those who practice the Dharma are at a disadvantage. Other people get to lie, but we don't. Other people can push for their own advantage. Well, we have our principles. But it's those principles that protect us, the advantage that people gain by harming themselves, harming other people. It doesn't last very long. It's good to remember that, because we're here for long-lasting well-being. That's what wisdom is all about. Which means that we have to train the mind to be patient. When the Buddha gave his synopsis of the teachings to that gathering of 1,250 arahants, he started out with patience and endurance as his themes. Of course, they didn't need any more patience themselves or endurance. Their minds were already beyond defilement. But the Buddha was basically giving them a basic rundown of the teachings for when they went out to teach. Because some of them had gained awakening simply by listening to one Dharma talk. And so the Buddha wanted to sketch out the larger picture of the Dharma that was to be spread, except for the good of human beings and divine beings. And so it began with patience, patient endurance is the foremost austerity. Now, the austerities in those days, the tapas, was the means to a higher end. And the Buddha was saying something very important there. Patience is not an end. We're not here practicing just to be equanimous in the face of everything or just to be non-reactive in the face of everything. The patience is a means to a higher end, which is total freedom. The Buddha said as much in the a line that followed that, Nirvana is the highest, say those who know. So we practice patience as a means, as, a, as part of the path. We learn how to endure painful sensations, hurtful words, train the mind to be like earth, as the Buddha said. He told Rahula, painful words can be said, but we don't have to react. Just like horrible things are poured on the earth, but the earth doesn't react. This ability to withstand difficult situations is very important, because we learn an awful lot that way. And the problem is that we're often tempted to give in to unskillful reactions. And so when you can't think of just the right word to say or just the right thing to do in order to end the painful situation, it's good not to do anything, just to be resilient. But things don't end with being resilient or non-reactive, as when the Buddha was teaching Rahula. Is teaching on being patient, having endurance. You do that so you can observe. Because he followed that teaching with his teachings on breath mindfulness. And breathing mindfulness is not just a matter of just sitting there and not reacting to anything or just letting the breath do its own thing. But it's full of all sorts of trainings. Once you've gotten sensitive to how the long breathing feels and how short breathing feels, then you start training yourself to be sensitive to the whole body to breathe in a way that calms bodily fabrication. Then you get sensitive to feelings of pleasure and rapture. Again, that's 
You have to breathe in a particular way in order to induce those feelings to begin with. They're not just going to come on their own. They're part of a conscious effort. And then you notice the impact that those feelings have on the mind. Sometimes they're strong feelings of energy, which for a while feel good if you're feeling tired, weak, run down. The strong energy is a good way of charging your, charging your batteries, but after all it becomes excessive, it becomes unpleasant. That's when you patiently have to look, okay, where's the more subtle energy in here? Tune into a different level so it doesn't have such a strong impact on the mind. And you calm metal fabrication then. So there are things you do in the breath meditation. It's not just sitting there watching whatever comes up. So the purpose of patience here is not just to be non-reactive, to become a clot of dirt. The purpose is so you can observe. Because if we're very reactive, we can't see things very clearly. Someone says something and immediately things light up in the mind. And it's not lighting up with insight, it's lighting up with fires of passion, aversion, delusion. They're blinding. I was talking the other day to a couple, and the wife was saying that she had returned from Thailand and she was really angry at her husband. And she turned to her husband and said, that's why I didn't see you when I came back. And I thought she was speaking metaphorically. But she left for a while, and the husband said that a couple of years earlier they'd been back in Bangkok. And she'd gotten so angry at somebody along the way to her house that when she arrived at her house she actually literally did not see her mother. And anger can get that strong. And so that little spark, which is so easy to ignite the mind, is blinding. And if we don't have patience, we can't see what's happening. We can't figure out what's the skillful thing to do. This is why the Buddha teaches patience, equanimity, so we can observe carefully. When the mind is very still, it's like putting scientific equipment on a very stable table. We don't have to worry about the table jostling and messing with the results of the experiments. So if you want to see something, you have to be very, very patient, very, very enduring, very, very non-reactive. This goes for painful feelings, it goes for hurtful words. All the things we don't like. If you want to learn, you have to watch. If you want to watch, you want to be stable. Now the Buddha is not saying that you put up with everything. Again, there are things that in the mind, he says, that you don't want to just sit there and watch. Greed comes, aversion comes, lust, jealousy, fear. You don't just sit there and watch them overcome the mind. If you can't figure them out, you can watch them for a while. But there's a purpose to your watching. It's to figure out what triggers them. When something unskillful comes up in the mind, how can you learn not to run with it? How can you learn not to, as I say in Thai, continue weaving it? That's what you're looking for. And you want to see that when unskillful thoughts come up in the mind and skillful reactions come up, they're not one solid continuous run. They come in bits and then they stop for a bit, and then they come again and then they stop again. And you want to watch for those spaces in between to see if you can stretch them out a little bit and see what moments of clarity can do. So you're not taken over by these things. You have your protection and that ability just to watch. 
and not get involved. And the thoughts will come and the thoughts will go. The thing is, they're going to come again unless you figure them out. So you're watching them to figure them out, to understand them. So you can understand what happens where those moments of total mindlessness come in, where you suddenly find yourself running with these things. Okay, what part of the mind was blanking out what other part of the mind? What part of the mind wants to run with things? What other part of the mind does not want to run with the things? There is a battle that goes on in the mind. And you want to learn the tricks of the unskillful side so that you're not fooled by them. It's like people in a war who learn the language and customs of the other side. Not because they want to go over to the other side, it's because they want to figure out how not to be defeated by them. And as John Lee says, a large part of the practice is learning your own defilements. But to learn a defilement doesn't mean you run with it. It means not running with it. You don't see it clearly if you're running with it. You see it more clearly when you're standing still and the defilement seems to run out from the mind, but you're not running with it. That's when you see how it happens. So patient endurance is a, an important protection in the path, but it has to be done with wisdom and discernment. I was reading a passage where John Cha reported going to the palace in Bangkok one time. He was invited for a meal with a couple other Forester Johns, and apparently there were some political difficulties at the time, and the king asked the advice of the different Johns, and the two other Johns said the king had to try to be as equanimous as possible. When it came to John Cha's turn, he said, well, you have to combine your equanimity with wisdom. Knowing when to be equanimous and when to act. Which I thought was interesting, because often we hear John Cha's name is yoked with the teaching of just let go, let go, let go. Obviously, there's more to his teaching than just letting go. You have to let go with wisdom. You have to know what to let go of and what to develop, what to endure, what to watch for. Then when you clearly see, okay, this is what needs to be done, this is what needs to be dropped, this is what needs to be developed, that's when the equanimity and patience bear their real fruit. Because we're here not to be, just to be equanimous and patient, we're here for freedom. That's what the essence of the practice is. That's what the heart would of the practice is. And freedom lies beyond equanimity. It lies beyond patience. It comes from discernment when you see this is how you're causing suffering to yourself. Because all too often we're focusing on the suffering that's caused by other people, other things. And so we're ignorant, of, we're ignorant of what we're doing. Again, this is why the patience and the equanimity are needed, so you can step back from what you're usually doing to see that it's optional. You don't have to harm yourself in that way. So this is how the Dharma protects you. It doesn't send out protective rays doesn't come around and clean up your messes. What it does is it prevents you from doing unskillful things. The Dharma of patience, the Dharma of equanimity, provides the opening so that you can develop the wisdom that will free you to the point where you don't need protection anymore. That's what the Buddha promises, and it's up to each of us to test how far that's true. 